This video is sponsored by uh, you. National Park Diaries is now on Patreon, and you can come help me tell bigger and better park stories. Check the link in the description to see how you can join our Discord, get early ad-free videos, vote on video topics, and my personal favorite, how to join the National Park Diaries book slash movie club. Thank you so much for your support, and now on with the show. Today, Crater Lake is a calm, tranquil place. Located in southern Oregon, the United States' sixth national park protects this lake's beautiful cerulean waters, along with more than 100,000 acres of coniferous forests, alpine meadows, wetlands, riparian areas, and more. The eponymous lake is, of course, the star of the show. With a maximum depth of 1,949 feet, or 594 meters, it's the deepest lake in the United States, the second deepest in North America, and the ninth deepest in the world. Oh, and real quick, I just want to give a huge shout out to the surveyors at the US Geological Survey here. They measured the depth of the lake in 1886 with a lead pipe and piano wire and came to within 50 feet of today's accepted measurements. Major props to them. Anyway, these waters are world renowned for their clarity and purity. Most days, you can peer more than 120 feet or 37 meters into their mesmerizing depths, a testament to their cleanliness. But it would be a mistake to think that Crater Lake was always this beautiful, peaceful place. In fact, up until a few thousand years ago, Crater Lake didn't even exist. Its origins are violent and chaotic, the result of a massive volcanic eruption. An eruption so explosive and so cataclysmic that the sheer amount of earth ejected from it is, today, why Crater Lake is so deep. So to begin this story, I want to take you back. I want to take you back to the formation of the Cascade Arc of Volcanoes, which is this string of volcanoes that stretch roughly from southern British Columbia, Canada to northern California. These volcanoes were formed through a process called subduction. It works like this. An oceanic plate, in this case the Juan de Fuca microplate, is moving toward a continental plate, in this case the North American plate. Because the oceanic plate is more dense than the continental plate, it actually dives beneath said continental plate as they collide. As it dives deeper and deeper into the earth, it gets hotter and hotter and the pressure starts to rise. These increasing temperatures and pressures start to actually melt the plate itself releasing all sorts of materials like gases and water, which then begin to rise to the surface. As they rise, they start melting the rock above them. This forms magma, which collects in chambers below the Earth's surface and thus begins the formation of volcanoes. Now, in the case of the Cascade Volcanic Arc, volcanism has probably been happening here for tens of millions of years. But the volcanoes we see today, they're probably only a few million years old. One of these volcanoes is called Mount Mazama, and you've probably guessed it by now, but Mount Mazama sits at the very same location as the present-day Crater Lake. At its peak, Mount Mazama probably reached a height of about 14,000 feet, or more than 3,600 meters. It had been growing for half a million years when, all of a sudden, and when I say all of a sudden, remember we're talking about geologic time here, all of a sudden, 7,700 years ago, it blew up. We're talking about a cataclysmic explosion. It blew up with such force and such violence that it was the most violent eruption in the Cascades in the past 1 million years, and one of the most violent eruptions on Earth in the past 12,000. Let's put this into perspective a little bit. The Mount Mazama eruption ejected more than 12.5 cubic miles, or 50 cubic kilometers, of volcanic material during its eruption. That's enough material to cover the entire state of Oregon with more than 6.5 feet of ash. By comparison, the Mount St. Helens eruption in 1980 only ejected 0.12 cubic miles, or 0.5 cubic kilometers of material during its eruption, and it's considered the deadliest eruption in US history. So yeah, it was massive. It sent an ash cloud more than 31 miles, or 50 kilometers, into the air and ejected material as far away as Canada. Because this massive amount of rock was no longer present in the volcano's inner chamber, there was simply nothing there to hold it up any longer. 
it literally could not support itself and, like a sinkhole, collapsed, forming a massive caldera. Over the next several hundred years after Mount Mazama's eruption, that caldera began to fill with rain and snow until, over time, a lake came to form. Crater Lake. Now, the depth of Crater Lake is, of course, proportional to the depth of the caldera. The deeper the caldera, the more water can fill it up. And the depth of the caldera is attributable to the absolutely gargantuan eruption of Mount Mazama. So we can attribute the depth of Crater Lake to the mammoth eruption of the volcano in which it now sits. The Klamath people even tell of Crater Lake's fiery origins in their histories. They tell the story of a seismic battle between the chieftain of the below world, Lao, who dwelled in Mount Mazama, and the chieftain of the above world, Skell. Lao liked to come out of his mountain sometimes, and during one of his visits spotted the daughter of a local chieftain and asked to marry her. When she refused, Lao vowed to destroy her people by throwing fire down upon them. Skell takes pity on the people below and begins protecting them from atop Mount Shasta. Skell battles Lao until he is eventually driven back inside the mountain. The next day, the mountain is gone and torrential rains then filled the crater, creating Crater Lake, what the Klamath referred to as Jiwas. But there are some other interesting factors and tidbits which I think are worth mentioning here that will help us understand Crater Lake even further. For one, Mount Mazama wasn't done erupting. Subsequent eruptions weren't as big or as violent, but they happened. Crater Lake's most famous feature, Wizard Island, is the result of post-caldera volcanic activity. Same with the fully submerged Miriam Cone. This helps to remind us that despite its calm and tranquil appearance on the outside, Crater Lake still sits on top of an active volcano in a region filled with active volcanoes. Scientists do expect Mount Mazama to erupt again, although they don't expect it anytime soon and they don't expect it to be nearly as catastrophic. As for the water itself, if you're like me, you're probably wondering why it doesn't just overflow the crater. After all, if rain and snow filled the crater, why don't they keep filling it? I mean, on average, Crater Lake receives about 80 inches or 203 centimeters of precipitation annually, but only 30 inches or 76 centimeters evaporate off the lake in that same time. And there are no river or stream outlets from the lake either, so no water leaves that way. Side note here, this is actually why the lake has such clean and pure water. The only way it's refilled is through precipitation, so no sediments or pollutants are carried to it through streams or rivers. So if water is entering the lake twice as fast as it's evaporating off of it, why doesn't it overflow? The answer, my friends, is seepage. Researchers have discovered a porous layer of rock along the northeast wall of the caldera an area known as the Palisades that essentially acts like a bathtub drain. Basically, Crater Lake was able to fill pretty quickly after it first formed, but once the water reaches this porous rock layer, it drains away before it can continue to fill above the rim. This porous rock actually drains away something like 2 million gallons of water per hour. What we don't know is where that water goes. Scientists have sampled several surface water sources near the lake to see if that seepage pops up anywhere on the surface, and so far, no luck. It's one of the remaining mysteries of Crater Lake. Now, that 2 million gallons sounds like a lot, and it is, but remember, Crater Lake receives a ton of water each year. Its levels have actually remained relatively stable since officials have been monitoring it. It fluctuates with the seasons and with smaller climatic changes, but on the whole, it's a pretty stable system. It's a unique system, and one of the many reasons Crater Lake has been in the park system as long as it has, and attracted the fascinations of so many. But we have to talk about climate change. It's a frequent party pooper on this channel, and for all of its exquisite beauty, Crater Lake is not immune to its effects. Remember that crystal clear, super pure water we talked about? Yeah. Climate change might have something to say about that. See, Crater Lake has this process called deep water mixing. Basically, in the wintertime, really cold air temperatures cause water near the surface of the lake to become colder than those in the bottom of the lake. This temperature differential causes the water to circulate. Surface water sinks down to the bottom, and bottom water comes up to the surface. This process has two main outcomes. First, the bottom water contains organic matter and nutrients, and when it's brought to the surface, it causes algae to grow. 
and the surface water that sinks down to the bottom replenishes the oxygen that is depleted there by decaying organic matter. In normal times, this is good and healthy for the lake. It's part of a normal process. But with climate change, rising winter temperatures may slow or even stop this deep water mixing. That will allow even more algae and organic matter to build up on the bottom so that when it is brought to the surface, larger algae blooms could occur and impair Crater Lake's famously pure water. Likewise, failure to replenish oxygen levels at the bottom of the lake will impact those species down there who rely on it. Basically, climate change is threatening to disrupt a process Crater Lake has fine-tuned over thousands of years. And only time will tell how Crater Lake responds to these latest changes thrust upon it. Change being something Crater Lake knows all too well. From the nearly imperceptible changes of Mount Mazama's growth to the cataclysmic changes of its eruption to the now cyclical changes of Crater Lake's hydrological cycle, this is a place with thousands of years of geological and ecological changes. I think it's safe to say that, no matter their form, Crater Lake is in store for still more changes. Hey there, if you like this story and would like to support the channel further, National Park Diaries is now on Patreon. Your support helps me to tell bigger and better park stories and bring them to even more people. You can go to patreon.com slash nationalparkdiaries to see how you can access our Discord server, get early ad-free videos, vote on channel topics, and my personal favorite, join the National Park Diaries book club. Your support means a lot to me, so thank you, and thanks for watching. Goodbye.